Well, uh, the big news in Europe, of course, is the unification of Europe. And um, we always hear the bad news about Europe, like right now there's bad news about Europe and uh, the Euros are going to make it or whatever. But, you know, Europe is here to stay. The notion of Europe is, is, is I think, well established now. And you, when you think about the unification of Europe, you've got to remember Europe has created a free trade zone of 400 million people with an economy as big as the United States, $13 trillion produced in a year. The United States, a free trade zone of 300 million people producing $13 trillion. Europe, 400 million. Now, if you think about the beginnings of Europe, think about Europhiles, Eurovisionaries, caring statesmen sitting on the rubble of a bombed out continent in 1947, marveling at how they have destroyed themselves twice in their lifetime, thinking we've got to do something a little more innovative here or it's going to happen again. We need to create a United States of Europe. We need to interweave our economies to the point where Germany and France will never again go to war against each other. There's been a lot of goofy stuff about Europe, but in 50 or 60 years since then, they have interwoven their economies to the point where I don't think a war between France and Germany is conceivable now. That makes all the other foibles of the European Union small stuff. Europe is a triumph because of that. Now, uh, when you think about Europe, it's kind of goes, it's a stuttering kind of progress. Two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. News when it goes back and then trudging forward. But it's come a long way in 60 years and um, it's got some serious challenges. But uh, it's quite exciting to see what Europe has done. Now, proponents of our system would look at Europe's system and say those idealistic Europeans, look at their economy as a basket case. They're so socialistic, they don't make anywhere near as much money as we do. Well, true, 400 million Europeans make $13 trillion, and we make that much with 300 million people. But the complete sentence is, they make less per person than we do, but they make, by every measure, as much as we do per hour, and they choose to work less hours. So, you know, it's not a right or wrong thing, but they just play more. And I think it's interesting, when you go to Europe, it's sort of, an, it's almost annoying, it's sort of in your face when you're, when you're traveling around in Europe. You see the energy that you've got, and then it's, you see these guys playing around. It's Wednesday afternoon, and I ask these guys, what's going on? What, shouldn't you be working? And they say, no, it's Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> these are men, these are not kids. This is what they're doing for fun, and it's just, Europeans play a lot, and of course they work a lot. We Americans have the shortest vacations in the rich world. We are just mindlessly working ourselves into an early grave by the assessment of some people that don't understand what we're doing. I've got a friend in Seattle who uh, produces TV shows for public television and uh, he runs a little movement. It's called Take Back Your Time. And his whole thing is to try to teach Americans that you know, we could have a shorter vacation if we wanted to make less money and have a better balanced life, more European style or whatever. And, uh, um, He's reminding us that we have the shortest vacations in the rich world, and his national holiday is October 23. Because by his estimate, if you were a European working as hard as Americans do, October 23 would be the last day you need to go to work. Sort of an annoying thought, but uh, it's just what the Europeans do. Now, um, excuse my clicker, it's not quite as strong as I'd like it to be. Um, there's a lot of chaos in our economy and a lot of uncertainty and chaos in Europe's economy. And, you know, I'm, I'm just a uh, tour guide and a travel writer uh, and an enthusiast about traveling through Europe, but uh, I'll give you my take on this. Um, I believe the United States and Europe has been living beyond our means and uh, finally the, you know, the get a, a reality check and we have to readjust things. Europe is really into its entitlements. You, and when you have entitlements, and we're going to be looking at our entitlements in our society too, you cannot just take people's entitlements away because their parent, their mom and dad worked hard and got that. Now you've dedicated your life to that promise. They're not going to take it away. But those entitlements are based on the assumption that there's a young society with a lot of people working, a few people retiring, and those who retire don't live very long. With that sort of a system, with that sort of demographic makeup of a society, you can have these great entitlements for old people. Now Europe is a geriatric continent. Not many people, because when you're rich, you have less kids. Europe is very rich and their population is way down. So you have less people working and a need for immigrant laborers, more so than we have. And you have a lot of people retiring because of modern lifestyles and health. They're living a long time. 
It's simply the arithmetic is not there. That's not sustainable. Now, what politician can stand up and say, you know, less entitlements, higher taxes, work longer hours, retire later in life? That's political suicide, but it's the truth. Sarkozy's doing it in Paris right now, and there's a million people marching in the streets. Why are they marching in Paris? A million angry people because Sarkozy said, you're gonna have to work to 62 instead of 60. And Europeans march. That's what they do when they're angry. It, you're, that's a manifestation. That's what you do is you get in the streets with thousands of people and march. It's way too much exercise for Americans, but Europeans do it this way. <laughs> Americans just find a TV channel that, may, that affirms their fears and then they, they, they go, yeah, right on, you see. I was just in Greece. You know, Greece is in the headlines. I mean, it's worse than France. And I was there. I, this is what I do. When there's scariness, I go there just to sort of realize, understand if it is scary, because I got tour groups that are going there. I want my people to be safe and have a good time. Mad cow disease in England, I go right to England and pet cows. <laughs> so I went to Greece a couple months ago and uh, <laughs> talked to people. They've got anarchists in Greece, troublemakers, you know, and uh, you got an economic problem, teachers are angry, teachers are demonstrating in front of the parliament, the anarchists, there's about 100 of them live a 10 minute walk away from the parliament. They get on their scooters, go down there and burn a few Starbucks and tip over a car and break a few windows. And it goes on the, on the news and it sounds like, you know, everything's falling apart in Greece. It's just a few anarchists getting headlines and then everything goes back to normal. Demonstrations are part of the way Europeans communicate as part of the healthiness of their society, I believe. There's gonna be a lot of demonstrations. In a place like Greece, if you were one month older than your friend, one of you gets to retire at 59 and the other has to work until they're 67. Last year they made an eight year jump in how long you have to work until you retire. That's enough to make anybody get out in the streets if you're on the short end of that stick. The big news in Europe is the movement to the east. A few years ago, essentially the entire Warsaw Pact joined the European Union. Overnight, 100 million new capitalists. And the geographic center of Europe shifts from Belgium to the Czech Republic. That's big news for Europe. And, of course, there's bumps in the road now with this economic crisis, but generally, Eastern Europe has been really catching up fast. It's a remarkable story. It's a festival, a pent-up entrepreneurial spirit in Eastern Europe. You go to Poland, and it's just like people are dancing in the streets. There's all sorts of new businesses. You go to, I was just in Tallinn. We're going to show, I, I forget if, I, I don't think we're showing Tallinn tonight, but it's one of our new TV shows uh, on uh, Estonia. And uh, it's remarkable how fast Eastern Europe is catching up with the West because they love this work hard, produce, get rich kind of uh, arrangement. Now, when you travel in Eastern Europe, you will find that um, here, like everywhere, there's an incredible sort of diversity. And in our lifetime, we can think of all the tumult in Europe, it seems has been regions challenging nations. Now there's three different loyalties in Europe, region, nation, and Europe. You could ask somebody in Munich, where are you from? And they might say Bavaria, or they might say Germany, or they might say Europe. If you talk to a friend in Barcelona and say, where are you from? They might say, I'm Catalonian, or I'm Spanish, or I'm European. Every city hall in Europe has three flags on it these days, the region, the country, and Europe. Uh, it's very interesting to me that what people like me, Europhiles, really love about Europe is the variety, and as Europe unites, it's counterintuitive, but the regional variety gets more distinct and more uh, vital because regions threaten nations, and nations are withering away. You see, the people in Barcelona threatened Madrid. The people in Brittany threatened Paris. The people in Scotland threatened London. As Europe unites, London and Paris and Madrid are not threatened by the regions anymore because you can secede from Spain, but you cannot secede from Europe. And Brussels, which is the capital of Europe, favors regions over political entities. They like the ethnic regions. So it's a fascinating dynamic right now, and you'll find the little languages of Europe are being more widely spoken now than they were a generation ago. People are waving their flags. For the first time since 1707, Scottish people have a parliament in Scotland, in Edinburgh. And now people can gather after mass on Sunday in Barcelona and dance their circle dance, the Sardana, to celebrate their Catalonian heritage. Franco would have locked them up because Franco was threatened by Catalonians. 
Now, Catalonian people are teaching their kids to speak Catalan first in the schools and Spanish second. When you go to an ATM machine in Barcelona, you'll notice uh, what I'm talking about. We think of Spain as Spanish-speaking people. But if you go to a Subway sandwich shop in Madrid, there's a good chance the menu will be in four languages, all of them Spanish languages. Because in Spain, you've got Catalonian in Catalan, you've got Espanol for most of the country, Gallego for Galicia in the northeast, or northwest, and Euskara for Basque people. You go to an ATM machine in Barcelona, you will always have Catalan, Spanish, Gallego, Euskara, the four Spanish languages, then German, French, English, and everybody else. <laughs> now, if you go to an ATM machine in Basque country, I promise you, you will have Basque up here, and you will have Catalan on the buttons. Not because visiting people from Catalan need Catalan to get money out of a machine there, they speak Spanish or English or whatever, but because of solidarity. These ethnic underdogs stand together. I was recently traveling in Northern Ireland, and not many people go to Northern Ireland, Ulster, on vacation. I noticed a ridiculous amount of Basque and Catalonian tourists in Northern Ireland. And I talked to them, what are you doing up here? Well, we're up here because we have an affinity for our fellow victims of the tyranny of the majority, the Catholics living under Protestant rule in Northern Ireland. And then, on the other side of the coin, I noticed on the city hall flagpoles, there were Israeli flags in Ulster. What's with that? Well, the Protestants who are keeping down the Catholics were planted there by London centuries ago, and they're dealing with all sorts of headaches because of this. They're not bad people, they just are the result a few generations later of being planted for political purposes, and they got a divided society with a lot of violence and, and discord. And they have an empathy for Israelis who are planting people in Palestine for the same reason England planted people in North Ireland. So it's, there's fascinating little case studies that you can see. And to, to gain an affinity for the struggles of these people in your travels gives you a much richer travel experience, I would say. This